Well, good morning, Golden Corner Church. Good morning. Uh, good morning to those of you who are part of the Golden Corner family who have assembled in this room. Good morning to the Golden Corner family who are gathering online. Last week, we learned that we all have a friend request pending. God wants to be our friend. That's right. Hey, listen. That wasn't a misquote. That's exactly what we learned. God himself wants to be our best friend. Now, God is already our creator. He brought us into existence. If it weren't for God, we would not be. God is also the sustainer of all creation. He provides for the birds in the air, fish in the sea, animals in the forest. He provides for all of us. He's the one that keeps our heart beating. He's the one that keeps our lungs functioning. God is also the Lord. He has all authority, absolutely in control. Uh, whether we respect and submit to his authority or not doesn't change the fact that he's the Lord. God is the judge and we are all accountable to him. He is the Almighty and he is the Most High. He is those things and nothing can change that. Now, when we accept Christ and are reconciled to God, He becomes even more to us. He becomes God our Savior. And He becomes God our Father. So if you're sitting here this morning and, and you're saved, you're a Christian person, God is the Almighty, He's the Most High, He's your Creator, Sustainer, Lord, Judge, Savior, and Father. He, he is all of that to you, but He wants to be more. God wants to be your friend. He wants to be more than someone you read about in the Bible. He wants to be more than someone you hear about in sermons. He wants to be more than someone that you look forward to meeting one day when you get to heaven. He wants to be more than someone you just know a lot about. God wants you to know Him. And I mean really know Him right now in this life. God wants you to experience Him on a daily basis. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to feel his presence. He wants you to be able to look around and survey your life and see evidence, lots of evidence of his power. He wants to be your constant companion and your most trusted confidant. He wants to be the first one you turn to when you need help. He wants you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He wants you to value him. Matter of fact, he wants to be first in your life. He wants you to trust him implicitly. And as your friend, I tell you what he wants. God wants you to enjoy him. Like any good friend, God wants to make your life better by unselfishly investing in you. However, when we're saved, God doesn't automatically become our friend the way he automatically becomes our father. Now, I'm going to back up and say that again. Because I want to be clear on this. No misunderstanding here. When you and I are saved, God doesn't automatically become our our friend or our best friend the way he automatically becomes 
our Father. This is what I want you to understand. Friendship with God is optional. You can be saved, forgiven, and get into heaven and miss out on friendship with God in life. You understand that God is not going to force himself on us. If we want to be friends with God, there are some things that we have to do. It all starts with reconciliation. We've got to set things right with the God whom we've offended. And I explained all that last week. Now, once we've been reconciled with God, there is a next step if we want to develop and enjoy a friendship with God. What, you ask, that is a great question. Well, to answer that question, I've got to share a story with you from the Bible. It's a short story, and I want us to read it together. It is found in the New Testament book of Luke, chapter 10, verse number 38 through 42. And, oh, man, I'm so excited. The verses are on the screen. I, just in case you haven't noticed, man, I, I've gotten old. So yesterday I was working around the house, and this thought occurred to me. You never sent your outline to Grayson so they could put it on the screen. So, man, I grabbed the computer. I'm scrambling. And when I walked in that door just a minute ago, this was my thought. Uh, I think you typed it out, but I don't think you hit Send. So I'm in kind of a state of panic. I'm, so I'm thrilled that I see the verses on the screen. I want, you, I want us to read this story together. It says, As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village, which was Bethany, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat. You see that? That's a key word. Martha welcomed Jesus into her home as her guest, welcomed him for a visit. She got a sister named Mary who sat down where? At the Lord's feet. And what was she doing? She was listening to what he taught. So Mary gets positioned right in front of Jesus, sits down at his feet, Gives him her undivided attention. She is hanging on every word, listening to what Jesus is teaching. Uh, but Martha, she was distracted. From what? I think the better question is, from whom? Uh, Jesus. Martha is not able to focus on Jesus. She's distracted from him. By what? By the big dinner she was preparing. She had a lot to do. And so she is distracted from Jesus. Martha was just too busy to be still and enjoy her visit with Jesus. But she couldn't help but notice that Mary was allowing her to do all the work. So believe it or not, she became very frustrated with Jesus. Not Mary. She became very frustrated with Jesus, and she didn't go pop off to Mary. What a bad decision here. She made a decision that if I'm going to pop off to anybody, it's going to be Jesus. So don't you look what she did. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here? You see that? My sister, those are three key words. She just sits here. Martha believed that Mary was doing nothing. Well, that just wasn't true. You know what Mary was doing? Mary was visiting with Jesus and apparently was enjoying his visit very much. Martha said, you know, she just sits here. Look what she said, while I do. She sits while I do, do what? All the work. Jesus, I'm doing everything. She's doing nothing. Don't you think you ought to do something to correct this situation? As a matter of fact, at this point, she really kind of, I think, crosses a line here. Uh, she tells Jesus. She commands Jesus. In other words, look, Jesus, you don't have to think about this. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to tell you what you ought to do. Look what she said. You tell her to come help me. That's what you need to do. 
So as soon as you think about this, she's frustrated, she's angry, she goes to Jesus, she confronts him, she accuses him of being uncaring, and then she gives him a command. Now, you know, at that point, you kind of wonder, how's Jesus going to respond to this? I want you to look what he did. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. He, didn't, he doesn't rebuke her, he doesn't scold her. He's patient and understanding. You're worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. And it will not be taken away from her. So I hear what you say, but I think you're wrong. And I'm not going to do what you've told me to do. I, want to, I read from the New Living Translation. I want to read Jesus' response from another translation, the New International Version. So this is what Jesus said. He said, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Only one. Now I'm sure she's thinking about gravy, biscuits. She's thinking about the meat. When when do I turn? I mean, she's got all this dessert. Is it? Is, you know, has the meringue brown? She's got all. And Jesus is like, really and truly, there was one big deal here today. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Can I offer you the best Hodge paraphrase I got of what Jesus just said to Martha? This is, what I, this is what he said. In the midst of all these details, honey, you've overlooked the most important thing. My relationship with you is far more important to me than anything you could ever do for me. It's priority to me and he said Martha you missed that you misunderstood that Mary got it Mary knows the value that I've placed on my relationship with her therefore she's taking full advantage of my visit and I think he summed it up by saying this Martha there are times when the best thing you can do is be still. Visit with me and enjoy my company. That's what he's saying to Martha. Well, there are times when the best thing you can do, the most important thing you can do, is just be still. Visit with me and enjoy my company. Now, what do we learn in this story? I think we just identified an essential step in the process of developing a friendship with God. Last week we learned to become friends with God, we must reconcile with Him. Here's what we're learning today. To become friends with God, we must visit with Him. All right, all right, listen to me, guys. Listen to me. God wants to be your friend. You understand the grace involved in that? The, Im the positive impact that would have on your life if you and God were the best of friends? But he's not going to force himself on you. If you want that, there's something you got to do. To become friends with God... We must visit with Him. What do you mean by that? People who visit with God intentionally set aside time uh, with God for conversation. You with me? Is everybody with me? I mean, people who visit with God intentionally set aside time so that they can just converse with God. During these visits, they spend some time talking to God, and they spend some time listening to God. Think about that for just a moment. I want you to call, call to mind somebody that you consider to be a really good friend. How did the friendship develop? You spent some time together, and while together, you talked. 
You talked and they listened. And they talked and you listened. You know, one of my best friends in the world is, is here this morning, old Danny Pelfrey. And uh, I tell you, one of the ways our friendship has developed. Every other Tuesday night, we get in a pickup. And we do what we call loafering. <laughs> we loafer. And as we loafer, you know what we do? We talk. I talk. Danny listens. That's the extent of most of our loafering. <laughs> but Danny talks, and I listen. And, and over the course of our loafing, or loafering as we call it, he and I become really, really good friends. You understand it's no different with God. If you and God are going to be friends, you've got to visit often you got to talk. I told you last week that God and I were tight. I, I would be quick to tell you this, that He is my best friend. However, my friendship with God did not develop overnight. It is the byproduct of visiting with Him often for the past 42 years of my life. So here's what I'd like to do. Based on over four decades of experience, I'd like to give you some practical tips on how to have a meaningful visit with God. All I'm going to do is share with you that over 42 years, I've done some things that worked. I've done some things that didn't work. You know, I've kind of navigated. I've learned a few things that I just want to kind of pass on to you. Are you good with that? Is there, would, you, would you be open to that? Let me tell you the first thing I do that, that works for me. And I'm going to get emotional. I'm going to tell you why. God's my best friend. When I think about him, when I try to talk about him, it moves me. Well, here's what I do. I prioritize and schedule my visits with God. I prioritize and schedule them. My relationship with God is priority one, number one. It's more important to me than anything in this world. More important than my ministry. More important than you. It, it's a whole lot more important than hunting or fishing or making money. Or I'm telling you, my relationship with Him, top priority. Uh, therefore, visiting with God is my top daily priority. Did you get me? My top priority in life is my relationship with God. Therefore, my, my number one priority every day is that I visit with Him. I promise you this, if I don't get around to anything else that day, if I don't help Lynn with the laundry, if I don't cut the grass, if the, if the trash piles up in the pantry, you know, neck deep, I pro, I, if I don't get anything else done, I am going to enjoy a visit with God. It's going to happen. These meetings are central to each day, and everything else revolves around the visit. Everything does. Everything takes second place to that. Uh, somebody said one time, you, you, you practice kind of a planned neglect. That's what I do. And during these visits, the cell phone is not near me. It's nowhere, it's nowhere near me. I don't want any interruptions, any distractions. Everything else. I can go check my emails and I can check the voicemails later to see but, but at that moment in time everything's got to take second place and everything else in my day is going to revolve around the meeting I choose a time when I think I'm less likely to be disturbed and then I'll tell you what I do I put that in my schedule first 
That goes in the schedule first. This is when he and I are going to meet. In my experience, I've found that if I don't schedule these visits, they're not likely to happen. I tried this, you know, getting up, starting the day just at a breakneck pace, frantically assuming some, it'll happen. Sometime today, you know, the, you know, the circumstances in my life are just going to fall into place and I'm going to find myself alone with God having a wonderful conversation with him. You know what? It never happens. What happens? What happens when you don't plan something and build around it? I tell you, there's so many things demanding my time and my attention and my focus that if I don't schedule this and protect this, something else steps in and he gets that time. Does this make practical sense? I want you to try it. Well, I want you to prioritize your relationship with God. Put it, I want you to put Him first, and knowing Him first, and enjoying Him first. I want you to try prioritizing and scheduling visits with God. I think, I think ideal is daily. If you can't do daily, more days than not. How's that? It doesn't matter what time of the day you choose. It could be first thing in the morning. It could be during your commute to work. It could be on your lunch break. It could be the last thing you do in the day. You just got to figure out what works for you. There have been seasons in my life when I did all, I, I did all of those. Uh, there, there was a season in my life where it, where it just worked for it to be the last thing I did every day. And I did that. I did it for years, Scott. Years. Then I remember that there was a period of time where most of my visit with God was done in my automobile on the way to work. At that point in time, that really worked for me. Now, it's first thing. It's first thing I do every day. I get a rather large cup of freshly brewed coffee and make my way to my front porch in the cool of the morning. And God and I visit. But you just do what works for you. The length of the meeting doesn't necessarily matter. How much you, some people often ask, how much time should I give this? I, I don't think that matters. I think the amount of time you visit with God may vary with your stage of life. If you've got small children, you're not going to have the time that a retiree might have. And you know what? That's okay. Now, when I talk to people about developing the habit of visiting God, I, I get a lot of kickback. I just get a lot of kickback. Lots of people think this is an archaic practice. Doesn't really, it's outdated. There may have been a time when people did this, but it was a slower time. You know, you, you, you got up, you, you, you milked the cows, you fed the chickens, you know, you just, uh, it, they, people then, that's gone, Ronnie, that's gone. I think it's unnecessary. I even had a pastor. We were in a pastor's meeting. I told you, I swore those off. And I remember we were in this pastor's meeting, and somebody said, do any of you guys have a problem, you know, sustaining a, a meaningful relationship with Jesus because you're so busy pastoring the church that you just, you, you've just lost that? Well, everybody, yeah. One guy spoke up and said, that's hogwash. I think he used a stronger word. And he said, who needs to do that? Who has time to do that? I mean, you know, I can maintain a relationship with God without making time just to be zeroed in, focused on Him and talking to Him. And, you know, I'm sitting there, I didn't say anything, but this is what I was thinking. Does that work with your wife? Huh? When you say, honey, you know, if... I'm going to go play around to golf. If you want to ride on the cart with me, you're welcome to do that. And I'm going to go hunting. If you want to sit there with me, you're welcome to do that. In other words, I'm living my life. And if you kind of want to get a, if you want to say a word or two, just jump in anywhere you want. No, I'm telling you what. I might be exposing one of the reasons maybe a relationship is failing. It doesn't work that way in a marriage. It doesn't work that You've got to give time to each other where you focus only on each other and you talk. But here's the, here's, the, here's the big one people say to me. It's unrealistic. 
Ronnie, you're just so far out of touch with our culture, you don't understand that how unreal it is. I can see how you can do that because you don't have a real job. And, uh, and, and, and you don't have small children at home. If you lived in my world, Ronnie, there's no way you could do this. Well, I did. I mean, from the time I was saved to the time I went full-time in ministry, there was a period of about nine years. Now, during those nine years, I worked a secular job. I worked six days a week, Monday through Saturday. I managed the household. I had to cut grass. I had to haul off trash. Help Lynn clean the house. You know, go out of the shop, get tires. I had to do all those things that everybody else had. I was working six days a week, raising children. And in those, in those nine years, I could count on one hand how many days I missed visiting with God. You say you're bragging. No, I'm just telling you guys. I, I'm so tired. Now, I'm just, let me just put it this way. So many people are missing out on the meat of what it means to be saved, throwing this, ex- this excuse out, it's unrealistic, it's, you can't do that. Truth is, you can. Truth is, you should. You say, how were you able to do that? I wanted it. I heard a preacher preach about it. And he's the one that informed me that there was more to this than being forgiven and just living a normal, natural life while you wait on heaven. He told me I could know God. And I could experience God now, not when I got to heaven. Told me God and I could be friends. But he said, You got to develop the habit of visiting with him. I wanted it. I wanted it so badly that I rearranged my life to make room for him and room in my day to visit with him. You know, I remember, I remember hearing this preacher talk about it, and I thought, well, I need me a place where I could be by myself. And this was in the month of January. And so we had this outbuilding where I kept the lawnmower, the weed eater, fuel, all this junk. I thought, that'll do. So one night, I, it was at it was, it was night, it's probably 24, 25 degrees. I put on a coat, walked out, and got in that outbuilding. I thought, man, me and God, we're going to have a... We're going we're gonna to visit here tonight. And th- listen, it was so cold that when I walked across the floor of this outbuilding, the boards cracked and popped. I mean, it was bitter. And yet I realized a couple of things. You know, one, I can't really enjoy fellowship with God in the presence of a weed eater. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too many bad memories. But, you know, I didn't give up. You know what I did? I kept looking. There's got to be some place. There's got to be a time. In my day where this can happen. So I, my, I, I lived in Tomasi. I was working in Pickens. It was a, you know, so I had a long drive. I had to get there. I had to start my work down at five o'clock in the morning. So I thought, okay, I'll be at the, I, I'm going to go, I got a key to my church. I said, I'm going to go up there. I'll be there about 3.30 in the morning. I'll spend about an hour with the Lord and I'll drive on over to work. I got to tell you, I tried it for a week. I was like a zombie. You know, I mean, I was so tired. There was, I mean, there was no meaningful fellowship happening here. So you know what I did? 
I altered. I, I started going to the church in the afternoon. You know what I found out about a church in the afternoon? It's busy. It, there's people coming and going. And, you know, they'd, be like, they'd stop in and they'd say, what are you doing? I said, well, I came up here to have a little alone time with God. Well, really? And then they'd sit down and talk for 45 or 50 minutes. And I'm, I'm like, well, I'm not trying to be antisocial, but I had a meeting. God and I were visiting. So I ended up finding this place out in the middle of nowhere. Locals called it the tabernacle. The independent Baptist churches in our county had a two-week meeting there every summer. And then it was vacant. I'm telling you, you, you had to want to be there to get there. But uh, I drove over. And... Uh, this is with God. And the more I visited with Him, the more I wanted to visit with Him. For the next 10 years of my life, unless I was deathly sick, or the few times that we took a vacation were out of town, at least once a day, I visited with God. At the old tabernacle. In hindsight, it's paid off big for me. I found what I was looking for. I, I found what satisfies the longing of my soul. I'm sorry about the sniffing. And then again, I don't really care. <laughs> Visiting with God is not only central to each day, but it's the highlight of my day. I'm telling you, everything after that is gravy. Nothing brings me as much pleasure as sitting on my front porch having an unhurried conversation. With my friend, nothing. Nothing I've ever experienced compares to the excitement I feel when I hear his voice. Nothing. Nothing on this earth compares to the joy I experience when I am in his presence. I've always loved the outdoors. I've always loved to be challenged by the outdoors. The longer the trail, the better. The steeper the climb, the better. Fishing, you know, I, I couldn't just do fish easy. I had to hike 10 miles round trip, fish all day. I, it had to be hard. And all that was very rewarding. I used to wonder, you know, when I'm older and I can't do those things, where am I going to find my joy? Where am I going to find pleasure? Uh, let me tell you something. Now, Boggs, I'm, I'm beyond most of that. And I'm okay with it. You know why? The pleasure I got from that pales in comparison to the pleasure I get when I'm visiting with God. And, and you know what? As an old man, I can still visit with God. Reconciling with God, best thing I've ever done. Visiting with God, second best thing I've ever done. You have a friend request pending. God wants to be your friend, but He's not going to force Himself on you. He's not going to do it. It is your choice. Remember what Jesus said to Martha? Mary has chosen what is better. 
You can accept God's friend request or you can reject it. It's entirely up to you. I'm going to say something that's going to sound pessimistic and negative. Will you, 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 you let me slide one in? It is the truth. It, it, is an, it is an honest and accurate observation I have made. In my 34 years of pastoring, most of the people that I've t- taught this to said no to friendship with God. No, heaven is enough, forgiveness is enough. I, I No, I, I don't think I'm going to do that. And here's, here's the excuse they give. I'm way too busy to do something like that. Way too busy to sit down and, and just visit with God. I, I, I can't. Busy doing what? I'll tell you what we have busied ourselves doing. We're looking for something to fill that huge vacuum that's inside of every human being. We're desperately, frantically looking for something that will bring lasting happiness and contentment. We think if I got a bigger paycheck, that'd do it. If I could get out of this dead-end job and get, get this job, that'd do it. If I could get out of this marriage and get me somebody else, that would do it. If, if, you know, if, if I could have this, if we could move up to this size house, if I could just get this degree, if what if, and I tell you, we are desperately looking all over the place for something that's going to fill the void. And it's a crying shame that what we're looking for is right under our nose the whole time. The only thing that fills that big old empty spot in us is friendship with God. We were made to fellowship with God. We were made to be friends with God. And I, you can look and I, you, can, you, can do, you can do anything you want to do, but I promise you, your search will end there. Your search will continue until you find yourself really developing a friendship with God. So, uh, it, it is your choice, and like Martha, you can choose a life of busyness that leaves no time to visit with God, and therefore, miss out on the literal opportunity of this lifetime. Or like Mary, you can choose to slow down, visit with And become friends with God. I hope and I pray that you choose wisely. You know why? I don't want you to miss out on this. I don't want you to miss it. I want you to experience it. So where do we go next? I tell you what let's do. Next week if we're all alive and well, we're back here like this. Uh, Next week, if you're able to join us online, I want to talk to you a little bit about what happens in the meeting. When you and God are visiting, what exactly do you do and how do you do it? Would that be good? Let's bow together. You know, there's a verse at the tail end of the book of Revelation that says this. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. He said, whoever lets me in, we'll have supper together. We'll fellowship. I only understand what's happening here. In each of our lives, there's a knock at the door. Jesus is saying, if you'll let me in, I'll become the best friend you ever had.
we'll fellowship together. My prayer before I came in here was this. God, I want them to hear me. I want them to really hear me. And understand the offer you're making. Because I want them to experience friendship with you. Father, help us. Help us all choose wisely. But thank you. What grace. That you would be willing to do this. What joy, Lord. In friendship with you. Thank you. Amen. You guys, you're dismissed. Have a great day.